Yep, we live. Are we live? Yep. We are live. How are you doing, Charles? I'm doing fine, brother. Just a little bit under the weather. You know, one of those things. One of those nasty things. But other than that, I'm doing A-OK. Sound like you have a cold, man. No, it's just a, it's just a sinus thing right here. I get every once in a while on this side of my eye, and it it hurts like a sound of a boop. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Welcome on this beautiful Monday, the 17th, with uh, Mel and Charlie live. Hope you had a great weekend. Uh, we're here getting set up. Uh, my weekend started off, started to feel a little bit in the in the doldrums there so i'm on a little bit meds right now just gonna knock off this sinus uh, infection here but other than that i'm doing a-okay i oh, feel for you brother it, that's not fun man not, not fun yeah but uh, so a lot still going on a lot still going on uh we got senator kochi senate president kochi on tonight uh, to share with us the goings on there at the state capitol uh, over the last few days. It's been a while since we've had the senator on, and uh, looking forward to a healthy discussion tonight. A couple of things. I mean, obviously, we'll talk about COVID. We want to talk about the COVID and mm -hmm. and um, the surprise visit or the unannounced visit from the Senate COVID committee over to the Department of Health. You know, there was a little back and forth between the governor and Senator Kochi. We'll ask him to to update on that. And we also uh, want to ask him about the Young Brothers. The the, the PUC just approved a 48% rate increase, emergency rate increase. And I understand there may be some conditions, but we'll let him explain that um, because I think that's going to impact the, the Outer Islands uh, quite a bit. So uh, ultimatum, you know, I mean, you're, you're, you're caught between a rock and a hard place. You know, they, they, you need, you need those barges to, to sail and, um, and they're saying they can't do it. So we'll, we'll hear it from the Senator as well as uh, we're all expecting an announcement from the governor shortly. I thought it was going to be today at four o'clock yeah. yeah. um, about a lockdown uh, that he apparently he and uh, mayor Caldwell has been working on. So I understand it's only going to be uh, affecting Oahu, but hopefully the Senator can shed some light on that as well. So a lot going on, a lot going on here in the state of Hawaii. Kauai again, uh, another day of no cases. You know, we got to keep it that way, people. We got to keep it that way. Uh, we did have some some reports of uh, gatherings. I think uh, Charlie talked about that in his post. Guys, we got to be responsible, man. Just the fact, the fact that we don't have any numbers doesn't mean the virus isn't here. And uh, we got to, Maui, Maui is uh, getting hit right now maui memorial hospital what was the number charlie 28 cases now eight yep mm -hmm. 28 cases in maui memorial hospital uh we cannot afford to have that here on Kauai at wilcox or kvmh we just, we just can't afford so to it, get you know like you know the sp spooky thing about it is just imagine you you're feeling a little tightness in your chest you call 911 and you know what's happening at maui memorial and they take you there and you say, boy, I hope I don't get anything when I go to those, into the emergency room. You know, you're kind of at a, really a catch-22 situation. I don't know what else to say. I mean, the reality is real, the infections are real, but this is not the first time. And it, it baffles me to know that when you have a facility such as that, what are the, just from an asking standpoint, what are they, uh, you know, doing about it? I mean, they sh I'm sure they have a plan already figured out because they, they had it the first go around. And now they get it going this go around and it's like, oh boy, it's like an instant replay. But the thing is jumping out of the box a lot faster than the last one, right? 17 staff members. Yeah. Uh, so you know that's 17 staff members that are not working. Yep. They're in either in a in a hospital room or, or at home quarantining or isolating. I mean that's uh, that's 17 less staff members at the hospital. You know I uh, 
we we saw a woman post. She had, she was scheduled for a uh, hip replacement today at eight o'clock in Maui Memorial. That was canceled this morning because of the COVID nineteen investigation. Uh, also had a message from someone who got their gallbladder uh, surgery postponed for two weeks. Um, now. I, I have I still have my gallbladder, but I know people that uh, have had issues with gallbladders and the pain uh, that that thing causes. Now, can you imagine getting the call saying we got to postpone your surgery for two weeks because that's not an elective surgery. A gallbladder removal is really uh, can be very serious. Emergency. So that's the two. That's the two issues. You got the number one issue where people now are getting their surgeries rescheduled or postponed. The other part of this, Charlie, is what you kind of alluded to is you have that tightness in your chest or you're not feeling well. How many people are not going to the doctor? They're not going to go to Maui Memorial because they're afraid that they may catch something. And so they stay home and self-medicate and then they get worse. Uh, so it's, it's, it's just a lot of, a lot, this thing has a lot of, a lot of arms that uh, the impacts and the effects. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's not a good thing. And, and again, we still see people posting graphics about how unsafe and unhealthy wearing a mask is. Uh, still get people challenging mortality rates and infection rates. Today, I think our positive rate was 7.2. Of all the tests that were, all the test results that we got, it was 7.2% of the tests taken or given. So that's high. That's high. So we are on track to really have a lot of cases. And um, we, the WHO again, has said that, you know, they, they commented on the outbreak in Hawaii. And the WHO said the number should be below five if we want any sense of, of, um, you know, curbing, curbing this spread of this virus. We have to bring it down. And it doesn't look like it's, it's slowing down any, anytime soon. And I just got a, I just got a text here from a good friend on the island of Molokai. She says her uncle's open heart surgery was postponed today until a later date. Um, what do you do? If open heart surgery is needed, you know, what do you just give the person a lot of blood thinners to make sure it's thinned out so he, the blood is traveling past that blockage? I mean, it's a scary thought. Very scary thought. You know, and the worst part of all of this, and Ron just entered in the, in the room, so we'll bring him in, but the worst part of all of this, all, about all of this is that there is no end in sight. Uh, yeah. You know, this, this whole thing, the fear of the unknown is, uh, is, I hear a beep. I don't know what that is, but. No, no, that's um, the, it's text coming over my side. Oh, okay, okay. She's, All right. She's texting All right, being well, scared. Let's, yeah. let's bring in the Senate president here. And... Oh. And there he is. He's, you know, he's such a veteran already to this. You know, he get them all down. He knows how to turn the audio on. He, he smiles now. Um, <laughs> welcome, Senator. Senate President Kochi, thank you uh, for jumping on last uh, last minute, very short notice, but appreciate you coming on board. I'm, know, in the, all... I'm in the house with Joy here on <laughs> Kauai, so I got to smile or there's consequences. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were just talking a lot of things going on here in Hawaii. Um, Tyson is saying the bell is ringing in my head. No. <laughs> <laughs> I got a pain in my ear, but not the head. Um, yeah, lots is going on. I think, uh, you know, we're just going to jump right in because, you know, time goes by so quick whenever you're on. But uh, let's just start, you know, um, with with what everybody's been asking about, Senator, is um, that whole issue with the uh, – we got a couple of things we want to talk about. Obviously, the unannounced visit with your Senate COVID committee and the response from the governor. Also, Young Brothers um, – PUC's uh, approval of the emergency rate increase, as well as the talk about a potential lockdown uh, from the, uh, at, uh, with the governor and, and Honolulu Mayor, Mayor Caldwell. So let's start with the unannounced visit, I guess. 
Well, I think, um, you know, part of the background to this is that, uh, you know, we've had a lot of meetings. Uh, I've been involved in uh, community leaders, the speaker and I, uh, along with the governor or members of his cabinet, General Hara, Dr. Anderson, in, uh, you know, the discussions on getting to ultimately what was the matrix of the uh, you know, red, orange, yellow, green, blue type of, uh, you know, way to measure things. And one of the metrics, were, you know, for us to get that uh, back to normal was to have adequate contact tracers. And a lot of people use the number of 30 per 100,000. So there was... Uh, discussion of needing to have between four or 500 uh, by that metric. And we were fortunate for such a long time to have such a low rate of infection that the, the personnel that was available were able to uh, maintain it. But, you know, my position had been that, uh, you know, the people want to know we're on it. We've got you covered. If something happens, we're ready. So it's not just about a current medical situation, but it's also about public confidence that the government is prepared and ready for a worst case scenario. And, uh, you know, we talked about engaging the contact tracers from the Department of Defense at Tripler, about utilizing the uh, guard personnel. We talked about uh, <clears throat> nursing students at Chaminade and at Hawaii Pacific University, which uh, presidents Gotanda and Babington had said, you know, they would have them volunteer to assist. And so with 50 to 100 at both schools, about 40 at Tripler and 60 at DOD, we could have stood up another two or 300 ready to uh, be deployed. There was a period where Massachusetts was running incredibly hot and they had uh, three levels of tracers involved and they had uh, you know lay people who were doing it that weren't highly technical and quality you know medically background as far as training but they made the initial calls and when they got to the point where it was beyond them then they would turn it over to the experienced person and then I think the other terminology that has come up in recent days that we now better understand is it's not just contact tracers, but investigators. And then uh, lastly, as it begins to ramp up and you have so much information coming into you, then you need some people for data entry. And, uh, you know, so we talked about that in meetings uh, for several months. The COVID-19 committee has met offline with uh, DOH and others before they're out in public. And these conversations have been ongoing and the DOH has consistently said, we don't need that assistance. We don't need that assistance until they finally engage in the contract with the University of Hawaii Nursing School. So, you know, one of the few critical emails I received about the visit is why wouldn't you have these offline conversations? Well, I personally have participated in 15 to 20 of them, uh, including the discussions of reopening to trans-Pacific travel and contact tracing was always going to be an important part that we had adequate people on board. And it's always been said, we got this. And with the UH contract, we got this under control. And, uh, you know, so it's not because we haven't tried. And then they also said when DOH has asked for support for funding, they weren't given full support by the legislature. So part of the problem is, you know, us as the legislature not giving them enough money. And I, you know, have not taken the time to respond to that particular email yet. But Senator Schatz is now on the news saying, what happened to the $50 million that was specifically for DOH? And one of the primary functions was for contact tracing. And I know when uh, the unannounced visit occurred on uh, two Fridays ago, at the very end, Dr. Park said, I'm glad they came. And I'm glad they, they've seen how underfunded we are. 
And even with 50 million, that may not be enough. So I think she kind of caught herself and realized that anybody was going to say, but you've got $50 million. Uh, that's quite a bit of money to at least get started. And then if there's more needed, then we would have that conversation. But uh, again, Senator Schatz is at a loss for how much of that 50 million has even been spent to date and uh, why those contact tracers aren't on, on board. So that's kind of a background of everything that led up to Friday's visit where they finally said, well, you know, either we're going there and everything they said is right. And uh, we'll, you know, we got to take them at the word and say, okay, then there's a different problem or uh, unfortunately, we saw what happened when they got there Friday, and it was uh, well short of what had been said. And, um, you know, unfortunately, the governor took issue. And I get the part about, uh, you know, would it be more appropriate to have called to say we'll be there in 10 minutes? Not, you know, can we get an appointment and wait three days or four days before you show up? But when he, uh, you know, did say in his letter that Dr. Park wasn't there and she was, in fact, on the video of Hawaii News Now leading the tour and he talked about potential, uh, you know, information breaches. Well, none of our members, once they entered into the Department of Health building, wandered around unescorted. They, went, they asked for Dr. Park's office. They were brought to her office. Uh, went there directly and she led them on the tour for the hour or so that they were in the building. And they said, ultimately, two other deputies joined them. So nobody said, you don't belong here, get out. They did the tour. And if there were any kind of information or, uh, you know, personal information breaches, then, you know, Dr. Park in leading the tour should have said, before we go into the room with the guard tracers, let me have them blank their computer screens, let me tell them to turn their papers over, you know, when we're going to the DOH tracers, let's just make sure there's no uh, information that could be readily seen that may compromise somebody's personal information, but it was not any action on the part of the committee that uh, jeopardized anybody's personal information and so I was uh, certainly pretty surprised that the governor would assert that they weren't led by Dr. Park when we have video footage of her doing that. And, uh, you know, everybody involved indicated she did lead the tour and, you know, any of those breaches. And so, uh, you know, I, I, it was a pretty strongly worded letter to me. So I felt that, um, you know, based on uh, how factually inaccurate his letter was, you know, that I needed to respond to let him know how upset I was that, you know, these accusations would be baseless against the committee. Ron, um, do we know where that $50 million went? Do we know if in fact- It's, it's sitting there. One of the things it's supposed to do is create an electronic database so that they can get information from, uh, you know, long-term care facilities. It's supposed to tie into CDC. You can't do a brand new construction or major renovations. Some of the money is supposed to be used for some uh, renovations to the state lab, and then it's supposed to go to contact tracing. I, I think uh, the 2.5 million with the University of Hawaii Nurses contract was out of that money. And uh, they're supposed to have a website that uh, is going live sometime this week that will have uh, the CARES money and the tracking of the CARES money coming up so that we can get a better handle on what's happening. Until now, all we've been doing is sending letters or asking for testimony either in front of the House Select Committee uh, or the COVID-19 committee of the Senate, but in all instances, the contact tracing report has been, we've got it under control and we've got almost 200 people on board. And I know last week uh, in their meeting two Mondays ago, the speaker had expressed concerns about the contact tracing being deficient. And 
I actually had some time today to watch his meeting. Usually I have a meeting that conflicts with uh, when they're on. And so I was watching and there was a lot of discussion around the issue of contact tracing uh, in the House Committee today. You know what really, uh, I guess, uh, that bothers the, the, some of the viewers, uh, including myself, is, and I, I brought this uh, before um, Lieutenant Governor Josh Green, that with the amount of contact tracers and the amount of case load, we we're very, very far behind. And um, while I, I say it's worth catching up, to get the cases done, it's almost futile. It, 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 it's almost futile to do that because, you know, we don't know if they'll ever be able to find the origin. That's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to figure out is how do we get, when, when we have this spread going, how do we find out where the spread started from? We don't even know that. And that's what makes it scary because if it's in the community and it's going sideways on us, like it appears it's, it's doing now, then we really cannot blame any you know, outside influences, somebody traveling from the outside bringing it in. It's all happening from within. Well, right. Charlie, and I think, uh, you know, uh, and he was on the news tonight, uh, Dr. Mark Muguishi, the head of HMSA, during the uh, House Committee, he had mentioned that the, the power in the tool of contact tracing is when you, exactly as you said, have the numbers at that manageable rate so that you can quickly identify who and where and stop that individual or individuals from moving around, get them to isolation so it does not get spread. And when we're at this point, it is incredibly difficult. And so uh, we still need to get them on board, uh, you know, but it's going to be an incredible job to try and get it back to where we need to be, but more importantly, we need to get them in place so we can continue to ensure that what is happening on the neighbor islands does not turn into what is going on on Oahu. We still have numbers that are manageable where the contact tracing can have a real strong impact. And in the meantime, it appears that they're going to be uh, putting in some more uh, restrictions on Oahu and uh, if through the restrictions, they wind up getting a better handle on it to where the contact tracing can be more effective again, uh, you know, that's going to unfortunately come at a huge price to all the businesses that had reopened and need to shut down now. Yep. The, um, one of the things that well, we know Jennifer came forward and, and shared her story that there were very little uh, contact tracers on, on staff. And I'm not sure if, I don't know how long it takes to uh, bring on contact tracers. I know the state's plan is a six week training program after you uh, take your, your online training or whatever it is, there's a six week period. I'm concerned that in fact, we are already behind the eight ball. I know on Mondays, usually the numbers aren't as high because of the, the not as many tests get processed over the weekend. So we'll see tomorrow what it's going to be. But uh, I'm concerned that we may be, if we don't ramp up the contact tracing quickly, then it's going to be very hard to catch up um, going forward. And I think that is the fear. M you know, we see Maui now, um, with some, so a bunch of cases at Maui Memorial, that's affecting their medical capacity. You know, I, I worry about Kauai because we, you know, we don't have many uh, ICU beds and ventilators. If we should get a, uh, something like Maui here on Kauai, we're gonna be in some serious trouble. We already know that Honolulu is nearing capacity. So I, I don't know what, how long it takes. How can you accelerate training? I, I hope that's what the Department of Health is doing. Uh, uh, well, you know, the uh, part of the other thing is simply pick up the phone and call Presidents Babington and uh, Gotanda at Shamanad and HPU. Harrison Kawata, my chief of staff, had been in conversations with them three months ago trying to see if we could get a path to 
bring them on board. Uh, President Babington, by professional background, is a trained, uh, you know, skilled nurse. So she fully understands this. And I, I think that they would have some people that would be ready right away. I believe we had 60 guard personnel who are capable. We'd only been engaging 10. I think we need to be sure that all of them are being utilized. And, and we certainly need to ask uh, the DOD if they have any available personnel, what is their current load based on uh, any infections in the military. And uh, you know, take the help where we can. I believe though that uh, they have now started engaging the community health centers, which are a large part of the healthcare delivery system on Oahu. And so that's going to be uh, helpful. And then I don't know if you email from Lieutenant Governor Green, but I've been in Dr. Miskovich with other Health profession, healthcare professionals in the state, and would have upwards of four or five hundred who would be ready to volunteer their time and assist right away. But it's just assimilating volunteers, getting that space at the convention center stood up. So if everybody needed to be in an area safely, that we could do that. Um, you know, and then a lot of this work is on uh, the phone, calling people and talking to them. So. You know, well, I see some of the comments about how each island needs their own. You know, we certainly need to dedicate some personnel and to the extent that we could have people on island, that's great. But uh, if we need to, we need to know that people at the convention center could be quickly deployed. Like when we had that one cluster where we went from, uh, you know, large family unit, maybe 15, 20 people and then they were involved in a church with upwards of 70 and, uh, you know, DOH deployed somebody on Sunday with test kits to do 70 tests for all of the church members right away. And, uh, you know, so it's good to know that we've got that backup assistance available on Oahu. And to your earlier point, I heard Mayor Kawakami on the radio today. I won't mention Ron Wiley because I don't want to endorse any particular show. But, uh, you know, he was, again, stressing that, you know, why we're so vigilant on Kauai is because our ICU and uh, ventilator capacity is not much more than 10 of each. And so, you know, we can't get overrun quickly. Well, I guess the reverse, we could easily get overrun quickly, you know, if we're not very careful. Yeah, and then that, that is, I think, the biggest concern. The numbers, you know, I mean, the numbers are alarming, and, and you know, a lot of these positives may not even make it to the hospital. You know, they, they're not that sick, but but we don't have that. You know, one one major cluster on Kauai will, will be detrimental, and that, I think, is always the fear. Now, I did see House Speaker uh, Psyche today uh, send a letter over, I, I believe it was to the Department of Health, asking for more transparency in in the cases in oh they sent uh, that last week oh it was last week okay I and just they got a response it. this week but he said he still thinks it needs to be a little more i know senator kidani the education chair was concerned uh you know when you just say the complex area and not the individual school it's hard for us to prepare the correct response if we don't have enough information and he was very clear that he wasn't asking for information that would violate uh, any of the Hawaii information privacy laws or HIPAA, but uh, you know that there was a certain level of information you need to be effective. And I know you and Charlie have been on this from uh, the very onset. How can you tell, uh, you know, if somebody doesn't know all the people who are in the restaurant, so they would report the people that they know, but you don't know, like I was at Tip Top at 11 a.m. on Tuesday, or I was at Danny's for breakfast at 6.30. You know, I went to uh, Gina's in Waimea this day, this time. And uh, so people would know, uh, you know, if I was in there, I was in the supermarket, uh, you know, maybe I should uh, get tested, monitor myself. 
Yeah, you know, we, we have been talking about other jurisdictions that use uh, electronic means apps. And, uh, you know, it just it just baffles me that we're already five months in and, and we still cannot even get the contact tracing down uh, when the city and county facilities have positive cases, whether it's the city bus or uh, a summer fund program or whatever the case may be, those they have, there's no hesitation to release the information of the specifics. And it's always a question. Tomorrow we'll have uh, Dr. Stephanie Yan. Uh, she has been talking about this app. We have the app development uh, uh, tech leader will be on as well with her tomorrow night to discuss this app that she's going to be making, a, or they are gonna be making a presentation to, to the Lieutenant Governor and his team. And we're hoping that we can get some, some high tech systems to help us. And I, I'm not, not sure why the hesitance by the Department of Health from day one, they've had more than enough time to research what's available and, uh, and move down that road and, and just, they just haven't done it. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm interested to see what this app can do and we'll hear about that tomorrow. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm still curious about the contact tracing only because like for, you know, Kauai, it's been said that we have 50 and yet the whistleblower said there was one on each island only for, for a total of three. I mean, because today I received a call from an individual who was a contact of a direct COVID patient. And he reiterated to me that he was never called by the Department of Health contact tracing. That he took it upon himself to go get tested and to quarantine. So they never asked him any questions of who he came, how, when did he come in contact with the infected person? And how he found out was the infected person called him they tell them, hey, I'm infected. You better go get checked. It wasn't the state contact tracer. So that's those are the kind of glitches that I see. It, we get these calls every here and there saying, you know, we're waiting for somebody to contact us. And I can see that if a spread happens, like, like a 31, a super spreader, it's going to be so fast. We, we won't be able to catch it up. It's, I mean, it's just going to take over. And that's that's what I'm that's what I'm fearful fearful of. Yes, but that's why I, I really think it's so important to get that convention center stood up so that you would have people that can be redeployed at least with their phones instantly when you know that that pops up and at least for Kauai in particular because our baseline is so low at, at this point. Hopefully we can have the contact tracing work as uh, it is intended to work and you know, really make sure we shut it down quickly before there's any spread. I know I watched the uh, other night when Mayor Kawakami was on and uh, you know, the discussion came up about Polihali. And when I talked to the mayor later, I told him, you know, uh, early on there was a lot of speculation, including by the two of you that maybe Kauai's numbers were low because we had such low test numbers. And if we did more widespread testing, then there may be more prevalence. And even as that testing has stepped up here, you just haven't seen it. And I did share with the mayor, I said, I really think that Kauai has done an effective job of keeping the virus out. There is no way that you could have a thousand people together like you did at Polihali and not have a super spreader event if it was in the community. And, and I can only say an echo. We've been given a second chance. You know, we've done some things that are really not in the best interests of everybody's health here on Kauai. And nothing incredibly bad has happened. So, you know, let's count our blessings that we've been given the second opportunity to get this thing right and for us to continue to get it right, we are going to need all of us in the community to help do the self-policing and create the kind of peer pressure that everybody knows what the correct behavior is supposed to be and, and we all act responsibly. And you can see what has happened on Oahu now and how quickly that thing can change. Uh, you know, as for myself, you know, when I was on the first few times, I was joking because I had not been able to come to Kauai. 
I was afraid to come to Kauai because there was no virus and I was on Oahu as everybody's prevalence was low and we ended the session. Uh, you know, we did have an exemption to travel back and forth. And, uh, you know, I uh, did come back a few times and uh, now as Oahu increased, I returned from Oahu Monday evening before the quarantine went into effect. Uh, you know, I've tried to limit my traveling, uh, you know, to the market, get my coffee, maybe buy breakfast, go home. Uh, but I've spent a lot more time at home. And, uh, you know, I'm just uh, not expecting to go back to Oahu for uh, another two or three weeks. And I'm also accepting the fact that when I am needed physically to be at the Capitol and I go, I probably won't be coming back for a while. Uh, you know, there are no real uh, broad exemptions for any essential workers, including legislators. And with the prevalence rate that's on Oahu, I understand why Mayor Kawakami is so strict in what would be considered an exemption. I'm just saying what's factually occurring. I am in no way complaining about the rules he has in place. He's got the rules in place to try and protect the people of Kauai. I understand it, I appreciate it, and I certainly will support and abide by it. Let, let me jump, let me jump uh, course here, then we'll go back to uh, the topics that Mel mentioned. But you, you said, you know, Kauai was given a second chance and we gotta do it right the second time around because we may not be given a third chance. Question is, with our prisons, they had an early release program before when there was no COVID cases and and now, because I just found out from a source that, um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the release program um, is, is being touted by the uh, public defender. But here's the question. I understand that possibly infected ones are being released into the public, especially if they're homeless or have nowhere to go. What does the, what does the release do? I mean, that's why we had so much a return, you know, the one, the first group that was released, many of them had no place to go and they just got picked up again. They don't even have a hundred bucks to uh, pay bail if they, if they get caught for one uh, petty misdemeanor. Well, from the news reports that I've seen, if you are positive, you are not supposed to be released. You know, one of the conditions to be uh, released is you're, you're not a positive, and then they certainly had certain offenses, which, uh, you know, you would be ineligible to be released. But in tonight's news, they started talking about pretrial detainees on felony offenses, potentially not, not going in. And uh, I know that there was uh, great concern on that early release program. The last time I believe 40% of those released were rearrested for right. crimes. And so we're in a really tough spot in dealing with this. And on the first go around, whether it was the prisons, it was long-term care facilities, nursing homes, we had zero in all of those areas. And, uh, you know, that's not the case today on Oahu. And another thing was about the staffing. I know because of uh, the positive rates of COVID, it is hurting the staffing there is staffing shortage. And um, one source, you know, I, I kind of asked the source about the, the riots that broke out, the riots that broke out in, inside the prison. I know that uh, some of them got fed too late, but then uh, one source mentioned that really what they had to eat the night of the riot or the day of the riot was two semi cooked hot dogs, a can of pears, and I think a couple loaves of bread, that's it. I think when you feed people that's cooped up for that period of time, you will get a large pushback. I mean, did you hear anything like that on, on the, the eating? You know what they're I, I did not hear about the food part. And, and the part that's, uh, I guess, sad for me to hear is we had been working with Brian Watanabe, who was in charge of the food services for the prison in our farm to state program at Waiava. They have... Uh, large farm where they grow a lot of the fruits and vegetables they eat. And Brian had been bringing in 
uh, off-grade papaya because they weren't being sold in the market. They were being sliced and served on the plate and was great. And, you know, we were really hoping to make great strides, not just in our schools and hospitals, but to uh, be sure the prisons were sourcing locally. And, you know, when I hear that, then, uh, you know, we're far from our goal in uh, what uh, not just would be a better nutritious meal for the inmates to prevent some of this uh, bad behavior because they're upset with the meals, but also supporting our local farmers. Unfortunately, Brian had a good offer. I think he was in that uh, age where he could retire. And so in April, I think it was, he left the prisons. And so I'm not sure who took over. But when we had some information about uh, the initial onset of the prison, I had forwarded the information I got to the COVID-19 committee. I believe that they will be scheduling, uh, you know, for public safety to come in and appear before the committee. Uh, obviously, you know what they were doing last week, Friday, they were a little busy <laughs> and they weren't working on the prison issue. And not that it isn't important because it um, is endangering a lot of lives, uh, you know, when uh, they start burning things and clogging up the water lines and different uh, different kind of things. So hopefully the COVID-19 committee will have them, uh, you know, in front of them soon and we can all uh, see what that discussion is about. That, that whole uh, prison thing, I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I, we know that uh, lawsuits will follow. I mean, when we look at what we, uh, when we, what we see, when we look at the policy, Charlie has been uh, posting some of the, the policies that, that he has gotten. When you're taking incoming prisoners and, and letting them out of quarantine after five days, putting them in general population, uh, the, the virus will spread. And now you are in a hot zone. It's not like, not Kauai, we're in Honolulu where, where we're talking, you know, triple digit numbers every day. You know, it's a, it's a huge failure by the Department of Public Safety, huge. And it just seems now the easy way out and understand the Supreme Court directed them to release these prisoners, but how do we assure that the prisoners that they release are, are virus free? You give them a test. We all know how this virus is. You, you, we all know that it's one test doesn't do the trick. There, there is no. There has to be another option. Maybe, uh, you know. I mean, obviously, we got to be humane. You got to treat these and these prisoners deserve to be safe. They deserve to be safe and protected and fed. But there are facilities that we could use rather than turning them loose because these guys, a lot of these guys, have nowhere to go. A lot of these guys have no money. They definitely have no job. Uh, and, and, you know, it's just not a good thing for them. It's not a safe thing for them. So I'm not sure if they understand the, the, what's going to happen. You know, we talk about second chances. You're right. We have a second chance. Maui Memorial had a second chance. Honolulu had a second chance. And, and the jail, uh, the second chance is going to be going to cost. And I'm, I'm, I'm not talking just in litigation. I'm talking in the after effects, the collateral damage that will happen, the additional crime, the additional virus that will be spread from people in the facility that were released without any type of supervision or quarantine request. They're telling them you got to quarantine, but hello, we cannot control the quarantine uh, visitors and, and people that we have now. So I that one frightens me. Uh, it really does the again the collateral damage that could possibly happen with that uh, release is going to be something that the department of public safety is going to have to deal with and um and we saw that. the statistics the first time they did it and uh you know they were i mean they were in fact uh concerning enough that you know the legislature had a strong message to terminate the program yeah and, and it was a wise thing to do the, the problem is when we knew, and I'm talking about the public Department of Public Safety, we should have had better control of these inmates coming in and being allowed to go into general population. I mean, it would have had better 
it would have been better to have not taken new inmates. If you didn't have facilities, that you, you couldn't quarantine them for 14 days, then those nonviolent petty misdemeanors should never have been brought in uh, to begin with. Because now this, this crisis is even bigger than and it was. And, and uh, we see the numbers continue to rise. Now, I believe Halava had a case today, right? I think I read that Halava may have had a case today. So that's even going to be going to be worse. So I'm kind of concerned about that as well. There, there is a there is a question, um, and I, I don't know who to direct this to, but maybe I'll, I'll direct it to you, Ron. And it's not putting you on the spot, but it's just to seal the question. Um, there's a group of uh, guards that went to the, the testing at uh, Kakako yesterday. And my understanding, there's another group that went to uh, doctors of Waikiki today. That was my understanding. So I had inquired. I said, you know what? Didn't didn't you folks get tested at the prison? And their comment was, they did, but they noticed the difference. The at Kakako with Dr. Miskovich, it was painful, but in the prison, it was like nothing. And the the humor of it all, which is kind of bad in a sense, is when the guards finished the test at the prison, and I guess that one was being administered by the National Guard, right? That the National Guard even told him, hey, uh, I don't trust what I just did. You better go get yourself tested. <laughs> now this is this is a guard telling a prison guard that he, so, I mean, what kind of training did the National Guard get? I, I, it, it sounds like- it's, because it's not so much the training. I believe that there is, uh, particular test that is less invasive. And uh, so if that was the supplies that they had, I believe that they were properly administering the test. But when you keep hearing about, uh, you should use this test, what about that test? You know, the Abbott rapid, rapid test in 15 minutes, but they have only an 87 or 85% accuracy rate. And in this particular case to be off by 15 or 13 percent is a big margin and so there's not a lot of confidence in using that if you are testing visitors coming mm -hmm. in so to do that large amount of people I mean that's just speculative on my part I'll, I'll certainly go and ask and I only know this because somebody had just gone through a test where they were specifically told it was less invasive than uh, the other PCR tests that Miskovich would administer. And I can certainly attest to the discomfort because I was uh, tested in one of the testings that he stood up, Dr. Miskovich. Okay, I and I had the tissue and I was crying like a baby when, when they were done. No, I, I had that before, boy. And, you know, I had to go on the emergency surgery because I had to go and try to find where the hell the other end was. The thing would never come out. You know? I know we, um, we, we're having a lot of firefighters now getting uh, testing positive, uh, first responders. That, that's scary when we start losing. Again, we need these people on the line to protect us. And uh, I know I did hear from some firefighters that they were trying to get in touch with the Department of Health. They can't even get through. They can't even get through. So anyway. To our um, Department of Health on Kauai? Uh, uh, Oahu. On Oahu. Oahu. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, Oahu. So anyway, um, any any additional, the lockdown, you know when that's going to come out, when the announcement is going to come out, any insights on that uh, that you may know? Um, since I talked to the governor last month, he hasn't really called me back. Yeah, I was thinking you're <laughs> but, probably not on that list. Uh, you know, I will just say that, um, you know, it takes time to put into writing uh, what you're going to do in the proclamation. I, I hope we're committed to better clarity and communication. And so if it takes a day or two so that they're going to announce something and they can communicate it uh, in a clear way, you know, I think that that is time well spent. The, the best uh, I can tell you uh, 
why it's taking a little more time is I think that they are trying to really assess where the trouble spots are and try to have mitigation there. But the last time when it was just blanket, we're just closing everything except what we deem as essential. And um, as an example, you take a hair salon. So there is a lot of potential contact and those um, operators were sending me uh, and other elected officials lengthy emails about all of the, the safety practices that they undertake, that their industry is regulated by the DCCA in normal circumstances and they are inspected regularly. And at least uh, since they have been reopened, I am unaware of any uh, infection report coming out of an interaction at a hair salon. So if they're gonna shut everything down, is hair salon in that high risk category and, and they should be closed when, you know, there've been no activities. Then they were saying that, um, you know, you've got all of these um, in the park that you can't do this uh, with, you know, more than 10 people. And then you go to the beach and you had all of these people at the beach and there were more than 10. And so where is the consistency in the application of the rule and if it's, uh, you know, about numbers, then numbers should be a concern anywhere unless you have square feet. Like, uh, you know, part of the Kauai rules are density by the square footage of buildings. And so I think that that's what's complicating it. But, uh, you know, uh, I don't see how Oahu gets around uh, not having more restrictions put on place. As to the severity of the shutdown, I, I don't have any better inside information as to what that's going to be. But I think they're trying to be more thoughtful and really target um, areas where transmission occurred. Unfortunately, you know, they've been at funerals and at other kind of parties, um, you know, where people just were naturally getting together, uh, you know, and so that's, that's the challenge. Uh, but it's coming. I, I wouldn't. Uh, I would suspect by Wednesday the announcement will be made. The the scary thing is, we don't know a lot of the cases where the origin was. That that's the problem because we don't have an effective contract uh, contact tracing program. We we find out if they were at a big you know a big location. But again, like Charlie keeps saying, we don't know where it originated. You know, it could very well have originated. In a, in a beauty shop or a barber shop or one of those. It's when we close down the first time, that's what it's so hard for all of us regular people to understand. When we were at a lower number, we shut everything down and we kept it. We, we basically flattened the curve. It was, it was a sacrifice, but it flattened the curve. We know what it takes to flatten the curve, but, but we still, we, we, don't, we don't do it. And, and, you know, pussyfooting around this thing like they want to do and, they, you know, they don't want to upset this industry or that industry. The prevalence of the virus on Oahu is pretty high and, and they got to be careful. I, to me, it's you, you shut them down and, and, you know, 14 days or two cycles. Yes, it's going to hurt a lot of people, but this virus is, is hurting a lot of people right now. So I don't know. We'll see. I guess we'll wait and see. But some of the stuff doesn't doesn't make any sense. Like you cannot. You cannot go to the beach, but you can go to a restaurant. Uh, you cannot go to a bar, but you can go to a restaurant with a bar. Those kinds of things is just, it's, it, and, and, but again, without an effective contact tracing that goes beyond the household, right? If we, oh yeah, I went home, you call everybody in the house, okay, test everybody in the house, oop, that's a cluster. But we don't go beyond that, and that's, that's what's causing a problem. We're not, we're not knowing one of that family members may have been, at a salon or at a, at a at a restaurant, we're not we're not going that level. We're not going that deep, and that's where I think we're taking a chance. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see. Well, hopefully it comes out by tomorrow. Young brothers, young brothers. Any any insights on young brothers? We just saw. I just well, I just saw the thing pop up. I didn't even get a chance to read it, but I saw the headline. KHON two pops up on my phone and said that the PUC approved. 46%. Huh? I think it was 46. 48%. 48%. Yeah. 
48% emergency rate increase with conditions. I wasn't aware, uh, Ron, sorry to pop that on you too, because it's relatively new, but, and if you don't know, that's fine. Uh, I haven't seen it, but I would suspect that if they are approving the rate increase under the special conditions, you know, certainly it would be for servicing all ports of call. You know, Molokai and Lanai are not high volume areas for them. So you'd want to ensure that they would get their service. The second uh, condition that I got a lot of letters or letters or emails from uh, my constituents here on Kauai, but statewide is that uh, LCL or less than container loads. And so uh, instead of being in the container and you wait forever on the dock to try to have them unpack the container in Oahu with Matson, then uh, you know they would get the container and then they would unpack it. And when it got to the dock, you'd be on a pallet. And so you could come in and get your goods. And a lot of the businesses on Kauai all have less than container load uh, orders. They don't have enough volume to fill up a full container. So those are two important issues that were expressed that they would have to service all of the ports of call and that they would do that less than container load uh, delivery. And I'm assuming that that would be part of the special conditions. Uh, I'm sure that they're still talking about, uh, you know, there are other means of financing that they could pursue and uh, that they uh, still haven't explored. And so, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens going forward. That, remember, there was a request for the, the state to, to bail them out, basically 25 million. That was not approved, correct? No, uh, you know, it was challenging because they were losing money before this. And then they were talking about uh, service into the first quarter of next year and the COVID CARES money would run out uh, on December 31st. And so would we have fronted money and then they would have said in January, you know, um, we're losing too much, that's it, we're gone. And we were very concerned that we're gonna have a long-term solution. And if it's not Young Brothers, then who might that uh, option be? But the neighbor islands need to get the goods delivered. And uh, we certainly were looking for something beyond just the first quarter of next year. Now, with regards to Young Brothers, is it, you know, they seem to be the only inter-island shipping line. Maybe um, the other big ones like Matson, maybe they just have some few deliveries here and there. But has anybody challenged uh, that you know of that challenged Young Brothers to come into a Hawaii and work? Work the uh, no, they they really haven't come in because nobody could come in and make money. Uh, you know, if you had to do Molokai, Lanai, I think even in some of the Hilo is not or twice a twice a week is not so popular or profitable. Rather, Kauai is profitable. Maui is profitable and part of being a public utility is you're able to charge a rate, but you're servicing all, all of the routes. And so there really hasn't been a keen interest from someone to come in. It isn't financially attractive to, uh, you know, really have a competitor out there wanting to come in and do it. Mm. Okay. Tough times coming up. Tough times. Um, I mean, you guys have a huge task going forward. I mean, we still haven't gotten this virus under control uh, in on a while. Well, now it's it, like it's ramping up. Yeah, but when I watch that, Mel, you know, Joy and I, we joke about having a black thumb that, you know, we couldn't even really nurture a low maintenance fern. It was, you know, on uh, life support when she gave it to her dad and you know, a month and a half later, we went by his house at Hanamalu and she goes, oh my God, dad, what a beautiful 
full thriving fern. Where did you get that? And he said, that was the one you gave me on life support. And, uh, but with all these increases and I keep looking at your Facebook posts on your garden, you know, I'm gonna have to figure out how to start growing vegetables myself. And if my old uh, Waimea friend, Bev Johnson can do it by watching you, I, maybe I actually can. <laughs> You know, that, that is, uh, you know, I saw that post. Um, Dom Akain uh, sent me that post from the, the, the Ms. Johnson and it brought tears to my eyes that this woman <laughs> who just said, we don't even know Mariposa, but we saw his garden. We like, we like have one just like his. And today I had a message from someone saying, Mel, can you take a picture of your garden? I want to, I want to grow, um, I, I think it was bell peppers or cucumbers. And I just don't know how, uh, trust me. You go buy seeds from amazon.com, buy the value pack. It's like a big bag of all oh, seeds of stuff you don't want to plant, but you take the ones that you like and you and you plant them and you water them and it grows. I, I don't, Ron, I was like you, I don't know what's going on. I still got to take advantage of this little because <laughs> that's not me. Everything I plant dies. I did lose a kabocha pumpkin today. It died, and I'm I'm kind of really depressed about that because I really <laughs> wanted the kabocha. But so I, I don't know what the heck happened. I don't know if I don't know. But uh, anyway, how's the unemployment, Ron? What's the status with unemployment? Have we gotten a handle on that? That's one that I think people stop. You don't hear their grumbling anymore because they just gave up. They just um, no, I still, I still get, uh, you know, about four or five emails a day and that uh, PUA is complicated and, you know, there's still maybe 10,000, eight to 10,000 pending claims and they're the most difficult to uh, resolve in a lot of the instances. And I know the last time I was on the show, I had said, uh, you know, send the emails to send Kochi at capital.hawaii.gov. Charlie put it up on, uh, you know, the paper for everybody. And, you know, we, we got emails. So anybody, uh, you know, still stuck out there, you know, don't hesitate to send an email to my office. I have one employee who is dedicated to dealing with this. So although I'm here on Kauai, as soon as I get those emails, I forward them uh, to his inbox, and he has a process he uses to follow up on those. Oh, I see you you kept it. So yeah, send Kochi at capital.hawaii.gov. Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of the emails that you want to save in, in your address book. He, he does, he's very responsive. I can honestly tell you, Ron, you've helped quite a few people that I... Uh, <laughs> They've called me, and I honestly, I just don't know where to send them. They've, they've, they're at the end of their rope. They've tried everything, and, and, um, and, and your office has, has helped them. So thank you. I ran much. into somebody at Kauai Cookie who said thank you. I was having a cup of coffee with Steph Iona, the better half of the Iona pair, yes. and yes, <laughs> getting updated on uh, some things happening out in. Uh, Kikaha Ag Association and, uh, you know, things going on with. Oh, no. Uh-oh. Hello, Ron. You know, this lady was blocking my. Oh, and I got to go. And, you know, then she let me go. She just wanted to say thank you. And office has been so fun. Oh, okay. okay. We, we kind of, we kind of got a little bit of that you got your looks like your wi-fi maybe uh, oh there you go okay yeah, we're hey, good you're good now we're good um i just i want to uh read this here someone says i just sent uncle david a long passionate email today about him revisiting the 230 million dollars cares act money that he was going to put in the unemployment insurance trust fund you know anything about that no, uh, again, what happened is in his line item veto, the governor had uh, vetoed the $100 a week plus up so that he had the option of not spending it if 
uh, the Demo you know, if the House plan had passed that 600 would continue, then we wouldn't have used our 100 a week. Uh, and uh, then we could have redeployed it for other uses. Uh, but as it appears now with uh, no real help, uh, you know, or Congress unable to come to an agreement. If we need to put 25% up to draw down the Trump money, then it would be put back into, uh, you know, doing that $100 a week plus up on the unemployment benefits. The other thing is it doesn't appear that the FEMA account he wants to use has adequate money to last very long. So again, we would deploy the $100 a week if there's no federal assistance. The part about the unemployment insurance is any of the CARES money not spent by December 28 would then be redeposited into the unemployment uh, insurance benefit fund so that we utilize all of the funds uh, before December 31st. But we do currently have enough money in the unemployment insurance account to pay all of the pending claims. Okay, so that, that's an automatic or is that? Yes. Or is it, okay, so that, got it. Thank you very much. Because the other problem, is, you know, as you hear uh, business saying the problems they have with the amount of businesses that went out, uh, the unemployment insurance fund is paid for by businesses. And so with less businesses, their payroll or their uh, contribution would be greatly increased. And so this would then help offset what they would have to pay in because there are fewer businesses and it would ensure that anybody who's out uh, unemployed would be able to get their unemployment benefit that they would expect. Now, going back to COVID, you know, in a, I guess in a, comprehensive sense. This new person that came in to head the contact tracing program, will that person be obligated to update um, anyone's head as a Senate committee as to how well the program is or it's it's being it's being touted out there and let go and somebody else in the Department of Health will keep an eye on it. Because I think what, what is interesting to note is what different ideas this person will bring to the table to stimulate the program taking off and being done properly. So you got me um, on that question uh, simply because the three of us are on the Zoom meeting mm -hmm. and not Facebook, so I cannot see any comments. So I got my phone here on Facebook and I try to sneak and see some of the comments to see where it's going. And so I kind of pull up my uh, calendar or email. The COVID-19 committee has just sent the invitations out. I believe they have a meeting scheduled for Wednesday. And uh, well, I'm going to have to find it, but the COVID committee has sent uh, invitations out. So they're intending to hold a uh, briefing this week, I think. And at least from what I read, the Department of Health was on the invitation list. Uh, I would tell you that uh, when that story broke on the visit, that is the first any of us heard mm -hmm. about uh, Dr. Robeson being there. Uh, you know, I, well, I think uh, I did not see the part when Dr. Park mentioned her uh, the day before in the COVID-19 committee, but she had been on board for almost three weeks and None of us were aware of it until that COVID-19 committee briefing, uh, you know, two Thursdays ago, and then with all the press coverage with the visit on Friday. Okay. Because I think, you know, something, something of that magnitude would warrant, I, I guess, you know, some, some update in that way, because everything, you know, like I've said from day one, has been the messaging. When, you, when the messaging is wrong, Right now, instead of having confusion, I think a lot of us are confused. We, I'm pretty sure government wants cooperation. And it's hard to get cooperation when you have confusion taking a lead. And I think, you know, this person can put a lot of things to bed if, uh, 
I guess you just told us how the program is going. I know she's only been there for three weeks, you say, um, but it would be nice to get some really good news out of that contact tracing program to see where it's at. Well, and, and the hope with someone new is that there's no, um, you know, agenda to protect or defend. You know, they're coming in brand new and the mission is to get the job done. So I'm hopeful that the attitude will be, if you're the new commander, what can we do to help you succeed? It's so critically important for the health of our community that you be successful. And whatever happened, um, you know, it's already gone and we can't undo it. So how can we make sure that doesn't happen on your watch and we get the job done and we do it well? Yep, I agree. We got a couple more minutes. I just uh, wanted to ask real quick. I know there's some speculation. I don't think it's speculation, but I think Tulsi mentioned uh, possibly congressional action or investigation or inquiry uh, into this fiasco. We know that the, because I watched, uh, Ron, I watched uh, the Senate committee meetings. I watched the press conferences. I watched, as you have, and as many of us have, um, being, you know, being told basically some uh, misinformation from the state. Now, Tulsi is looking at some congressional action. Is the legislature possibly looking at some kind of uh, legislative or state legislative inquiry into what happened and, 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 um, how did we get to where we got when, when you know, obviously we had so much time and, and I think so many opportunities to, to do what needs to be done. Is that something that the state legislature may be looking at going down the road? Yes. But uh, you've had members of the COVID-19 committee appear on your program. There's some ideas uh, that uh, you know, I've discussed with Senator De La Cruz that he and the committee are tossing around. Uh, he's been talking to Chair Luke and, uh, you know, until they solidify that, um, you know, I'll just leave it at it is a concern. We want to find out how we can get to a better place so that we do our job uh, jobs better. Uh, you know, people's lives are at stake in what we're doing. Uh, you know, and so, uh, you know, I would expect within the next week that you'll hear uh, some information about, uh, you know, next steps that we may be taking. Some of it may be as a result of the upcoming meeting and how that goes uh, as far as what, what actions may be necessary, uh, you know, to go, to go forward. Uh, Otherwise, you know, how could we go the whole time without talking about the most important thing that happened today? <laughs> Public school reopened. Yep, the 17th. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that just shows where, you know, I mean, between the prisons and, um, you know, everything with the whole contact tracing, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that every single one is critically important and a whole show in and of itself. Uh, so I haven't gotten any reports. Uh, it didn't make a splashy headline on the six o'clock news tonight. So hopefully it, it went better, but I know we've had lawsuits, uh, you know, threatened by HSTA and, uh, you know, it's all of these uh, various concerns. And so I just, you know, continue to say, I'm glad that we've got a great complex area superintendent in recently retired Bill Arakaki, a great superintendent in Paul Zina. I guess he was on Hawaii News Now. I heard him on uh, Ron Wiley's show yesterday morning. I guess he's probably replaying an interview with Paul. Paul has a very uh, you know, concise, clear way of communicating. I find him to be very effective. He was directing people who have internet access to the websites. He was very clear that each school has some unique physical characteristics to it. So each reopening plan and safety procedures are a little different, but they have plans for all 15 schools up on the Kauai DOE website and 
as we had talked about uh, election night and the last time I was on uh, the program like this about that uh, Kauai pilot program and the hotspots, the training and devices we've been getting. Now we are caught up in the supply chain backlog. And so we heard uh, Kapa uh, High School, Kapa L and Kalaheo were having uh, some shortages. They're working out a loan program between schools. They've done some reconditioning of older computers to have them usable for now until we can get the order in. And, uh, you know, we're still ahead of the curve and we plan for the worst, which was going to be 100% distance learning. If we needed to be there, we hoped for the best. And, uh, you know, fortunately we're better prepared and uh, the Kauai district has had good communication, but that doesn't um, take away from the fact that we wanna have a safe environment for all of our employees of the DOE and for the students who are uh, getting educated and more and more national articles are uh, about the concern of the students that may be lost to the pandemic and what kind of uh, injury that they are going to get in, you know, having uh, diminished learning experience because of COVID-19. You know, the, we've never, we, we've posed this question before and I, I just wanted to get your read on it if you had, you received any word, but do the individual schools have a isolation set up in case there should be a spread in the school on any given day? within the school, never isolation are set up? The, the protocol would be to shut down that room and have those students leave campus. And if it's bigger than that, then shut down the whole campus is uh, the two procedures that I was aware of and not that there was a specific place. Once a student is in that classroom, the, the process would be that whole classroom should go home and isolate at home. And then based on symptoms, whether they should be tested or not. And then uh, in talking to the two Oahu people who have helped uh, coordinate this program, they are working on uh, an app to have some of the health information and, you know, would like to interact with Mayor Kawakami. So I told them that if the progress is made and, uh, you know, it's something that would be a recommendation to be rolled out and uh, you know, try to give some better comfort to the employees and the students that the, one of the best places would be to get on the Mel and Charlie show <laughs> and uh, have an opportunity to discuss it. So I hope in the next week or two, we'll see some progress made on uh, the work there to uh, be utilized to help create a safer environment in our schools on Kauai. Perfect. Good. Awesome, awesome. I know someone just asked about the KT Shields. Um, it's sitting right here in front of me. I get 700 shields. And um, I just got a response today from uh, Celeste Bailey, who is the private secretary to Paul Zina. So we are, um, we'll be talking tomorrow on how we can get this into the schools and how we will be uh, segregating these so that the schools get what they need to get to the KT, um, to the KT that need them. And uh, we also has, have gotten commitments from Child Family Services, Women in Need, and Catholic Charities, as well as Holly Opio. If, uh, if we need extra distribution outlets, they're all uh, ready for the, the challenge. So uh, it is going to be going out to the Keiki this week, this week. So anyway. Well, the, the great thing is, you know, this community really comes together uh, in times of crisis to help each other. And, you know, I've been here for both of the hurricanes and, you know, now seeing the response from the people of Kauai to COVID-19, it, it's just been incredible to see the way the community pulls together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and our, our community has extended to South Korea. I just got, came home today and, and uh, had a box from Korea, from South Korea, of course, from our friend Miniko, and I open it up, and there's about 300 masks. Um, uh, it's it's sitting over there, but 
Uh, so we will, Charlie and I will be distributing that. We're going to get it probably on Saturday for Keiki. We got, we got about, we don't have many for maybe 50, but we got uh, uh, about 250 for cake, uh, for the Kupuna and for the veterans. Don't come if you're not on Kupuna and don't come if you're not on veteran. Uh, but if you're a Kupuna, you're a veteran, come on down. That was completely paid for shipping and everything from Mini Coal right there in South Korea. That's how far this community has spread, and we appreciate that. Um, and it's a nice mask. You're going to like it. And uh, it came with specific instructions to make sure we uh, hand this out at no cost. And uh, that's, that's how beautiful this whole thing is about. Uh, you know, we, we just got a lot of friends. And so we'll, we'll, as the week goes on, we'll let everybody know. But Saturday, we'll probably do a two-hour or so. We'll, Charlie and I will kick back with our papales at the Vidina Stadium parking lot um, and hand them out. Uh, yeah. Bring water, Charlie. I hope Charlie's feeling better on Saturday because otherwise it's going to only be me out there. Oh, my gosh. If not, well, we'll you, guys will have nice, you guys will have nice T-shirts, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway. Charlie, any more? Yes, Char so. Rob, hey, Rob, before that, Ron, you get any closing comments that you want to share with this our wonderful no i group. just wanted to be sure we got in a little bit about the the school and you know the great work that's uh, being done by paul zina and the principals here uh you know and uh hopefully the communication lines are a lot better here on Kauai. and uh you know we'll we'll see what happens i again you know you got that email from charlie and i'll be working from uh, you know, my home here in Isenberg in Lehui for the next few weeks and, uh, you know, not intending to go back to the capital, don't want to, uh, you know, get back into a quarantine and uh, really inhibit my ability to get my work done, uh, you know, and I look forward to coming back on the show again. I've got to try to keep my record intact as being the most frequent guest. Definitely. As, as uh, you know, your popularity has grown. Uh, you know, my my opportunities have diminished. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. And then you guys, you guys have done a great job, and so I, I look forward to see some of the election coverage. You know, we still have an exciting county council race, and uh, certainly the three house races have challengers. Although you've already held one round with, uh, you know, both candidates for each house district, uh, you know, and uh, aside from that, unfortunately, there's still a lot to talk about every day. I, I'm praying for the day when, you know, the biggest topic is what was growing in your garden and not the infection rates and are we tracing well and, uh, you know, back to looking at Charlie's Facebook postings on what he made for dinner or breakfast. Well, I, I've kind of, uh, kind of buckled loose on that, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I I like to say first of all, uh, Senator Coach Ron, thank you so much again. You know, you you have wealth of knowledge, and it you know it shows just by reading the comments. People want to know. I know we threw some doozies at you tonight. But, you know, like in anything else, you've always been a, a gentleman in ask, uh, answering those questions. So I thank you very, very much. To the viewers out there, uh, this is a little tidbit. If you have a sinus infection, I would highly encourage you, tell your co-host, maybe you're going to take it easy tonight because this was a stretch at uh, 290, almost 300 pounds, trying to stay awake because the meds is wearing off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to think uh, how I will keep myself in check. And that's, uh, and I apologize. That's why I was sitting back on the chair every once in a while because man, this thing is just throbbing on this side, but uh, hopefully I'll be better by the time we hand out those masks. No, I'll be much better. So thank you. Thank you guys out there. Well, thank you, Charlie. And get well, my friend, get well. Um, we, well. we just got, we just got, you know, Tyson and Rhonda has been on all the distributions. I almost feel bad. I never mentioned them, but uh, yep. you know, it's not like we got to give away a thousand shields. This is the cup. But anyway, Tyson, Rhonda, and Troy Wiley Ali will be there as well. So we'll have some humor. We'll have some laughters. And um, 
maybe Rhonda will cook for us, maybe make some bentos. I don't know. But um, so Tyson, Rhonda, and Troy, I don't know the time yet. We'll, we'll get the time together. I'm thinking probably 11 till 1 or something like that. We'll, we'll, we'll get that out later this week. Well, let's, um, let's do it. Yeah, like, I got uh, one, one thing, though. You know, uh, from my place in Honolulu, I was generally with inadequate lighting and the first time from my couch in my living room. And so I would be remiss if I didn't thank Joy for finding out in what is Egan's old bedroom that, you know, we finally now got enough light that uh, unfortunately you can see my face. Yeah, you really nice and clear though. Yeah, yeah awesome. and then the, the clear white wall in the back, no pictures, no um, things hanging on the couch that I could be criticized for not cleaning up. Yeah, I know Patsy's upset because I get my wonderful jealousies and the hanging curtain. It's tied <laughs> well, in I, I don't, I don't have my big blue slipper behind me anymore. Or <laughs> the roaches. So eleven till one, Charlie. How's that? Well, I was going to tell you. Check this out. The way it's the most hottest. hottest. <laughs> so we can grumble. <laughs> okay. How about eleven to one? 11, 11 to 1. 1. Okay, everybody. And Saturday, 11 to 1. Uh, come on down and, and get your Remember, we got a few keiki, but mostly for the kupuna and the veterans. We, uh, we will also have an autograph signing session with uh, Mel and Charlie. <laughs> uh, Mel will witness my ex. I'll put an X on whatever you want me to put the X on. There you go. <laughs> Tomorrow night, we have uh, Dr. Stephanie Yan. You remember her? She was on our show uh, once before. She's a, a, a surgery, a surgeon, a, a trauma surgeon. We have Kevin Vass, I'm going to say this wrong. Uh, Kevin Vaccarello, or yeah, Vaccarello, Vassarello. He's a, he's an app tech lead for this new contact tracing app that uh, we really want to help get pushed into the state system. And then Kumu Ras, uh, Ramsey, he is a, he's on the board of directors of the nonprofit who developed the app. So they will be on tomorrow night at seven o'clock. And on Wednesday night, we have Tulsi Gabbard. We have Dr. Miskovich. They're gonna be talking about basically recapping what they, with their press conference. And then we're trying to get uh, Jennifer, uh, the, the, the brave and courageous uh, contact tracer that came forward to reveal the, what was going on. We haven't got, gotten commitment from her yet, but we will have uh, Congresswoman Gabbard as well as Dr. Miskovich back on to share. So. And then um, Thursday, we'll Dr. Have, Kimball. And then Thursday, Thursday we have Dr. Kimball. If you remember Dr. Kimball, uh, he was one of the founders of the North Shore Urgent Care Clinic. He's now out there in Salt Lake City, Utah, as an ER physician. He's uh, he's going to be with us on Thursday night. He's the one so, that made the prediction. Remember, he made yeah. the prediction. If we're not careful, what we're seeing right now, he predicted it to the T. What was going to happen? In and we're going to ask him. Yep. And, and we want to ask, right. you know, what 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 algorithms did he use? I like the word algorithms. <laughs> uh, I don't know what the hell what it means, but uh, I hope that we have a lot of of our uh, decision makers on at the at the health department level, because you know this is the kind of people we can learn from. This is the kinds yep. of people that's been there, done that, and can contribute to our success. And if we decide to ignore those types of people. Then you know what? Then then no cry, no cry, because uh, you can go ahead and try to recreate the wheel. You can try to do all what you want and think that we're not different um, than the rest, uh, or we are different. I'm sorry. Think that we are different from Utah and Arizona, but you know what? We all made of the same stuff. And the virus is the same, has the same impact. So, hey, learn from those that have done it, please. Anyway. Um, Larry Aruda said they're cutting the trees at the stadium this weekend. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, well, we'll go by the soccer field. Yeah. We'll go by the soccer field. Just look for Charlie. He stands out. <laughs> he stands out. The big Hawaiian. Yeah, I lost it. Right now, I, I'm tipping the scale at 225. I, I feel good. Man. 225, yeah. <laughs> That's right. You step on the scale, the scale tip. Hey, shut up, shut up. <laughs> anyway, everybody, we love you guys. God bless. Thank you for joining us again tonight. Senator Kochi, always a pleasure. And thank you again. Last thank you notice. very much.
Yeah. Thank Goodbye, you. Goodbye, buddy. Take care.